Hello, I'm Father Jamie Mathias, pastor of Holy Family Catholic Church in Austin, Texas. Welcome to Extraordinary Catholics, where we profile some, you guessed it, extraordinary Catholics. We all know that there are various Catholic churches in our world, and we're familiar with the ordinary Catholics who comprise the largest Catholic churches, including the Roman Catholic Church with over one billion followers. The second largest Catholic church is the Greek Orthodox Church, which excommunicated the Roman Church in 1054, a fascinating history. And there are several other smaller Catholic churches, often referred to as autocephalous or independent Catholic churches, which share valid sacraments but are free from the structures and strictures of those larger churches. So let's meet someone from one of those smaller independent Catholic churches. Today we have the pleasure of meeting an extraordinary Catholic who serves as Chief Executive of the Ascension Alliance. Welcome Archbishop Alan Kemp. Thank you, Jamie. Archbishop, what a delight to have you here today. Tell us the story of your vocation. How did you first feel called to serve God's people? You know, I read the description of the questions that you were gonna ask. And if you had asked me this question yesterday, I would not have been able to give you an accurate answer. And so I went to bed and I thought about it and it, it came to me. This is that um, a long time ago when I was working in my dad's bicycle shop, after I came back from Vietnam, uh, I, uh, I had this, I had, I had a dark period of my life and I had to do a lot of self-reflection uh, look inwardly, take a look at my life and what was going on with it and so forth. And I had some uh, just amazing experiences as a result of doing that work. And uh, I'm working in my dad's bike shop and we had had several people come into the bike shop, steal a bicycle from the front, take it out the door and go down the street with it. Uh -oh. And so one day I, I heard a little noise. I went and looked and I saw that there was a bike missing. I jumped in my car followed the where, the where the fellow who took the bike was, and apparently we hadn't assembled it very well because the rear wheel came loose. And so I stopped the car, I approached the guy who had stolen the bike, and I had this sense, I wasn't angry with him, I had the sense that there was something terribly wrong with his life. And so I actually put the bike in the back of the car, persuaded him to take the front seat of the car, and I drove him to the Burbank California Police Department, wow. where one of our customers was a sergeant detective uh -huh. and introduced the two of them and what had happened. Now, I don't know what happened after that, but in a way, that seems like vocation, that seems like ministry, is, is that he was having a very bad uh, experience, a very bad way of living, and, uh, and I don't think that they ever prosecuted him. I think that they took him in and whether he actually changed as a result of that experience, I do not know. But I do believe that this idea that we love rather than get angry and hate makes the difference. And I wasn't deliberately trying to do ministry. I hope that I did do ministry at that time, but that sort of began it for me. Now, truth be known is, is that uh, Incredible. I, I did feel Go God's ahead. calling at that particular time in my life. However, I didn't feel really worthy of that call. Plus, now that I was having some success in how I was feeling and relating to other people, um, I, I made a mistake and I sort of said, I don't, really, I don't really know that I wanna pursue this particular path. And so in a sense, I said no to God. Well, mm -hmm. things did fall apart, things didn't go well. Uh, but I had a major change in my life. And then later on, I sort of picked it up again and uh, and just, and uh, began to pursue uh, the spiritual path. Wow. So tell us about the call to ordained ministry then. At some point in your vocation story, there obviously was a call to ordained ministry in the church. There was, and I'm sort of embarrassed to reveal what it was, but I think that maybe that's important, is, is that uh, I sort of, I sort of on a lark, uh, had seen a segment on 60 Minutes where they profiled a church that ordained people through the mail called the Universal Life Church. And so I got right. this uh, mail order ordination through, uh, through the Universal Life Church and began to start 
performing marriages. And mm -hmm. as I began to do marriages, even though it sort of started as a lark, as a joke almost, is that I began to take it seriously and I began to have, I began to experience it as a serious vocation at that point in time. And then sometime later, uh, discovered the independent movement. Wow, tell us about how that came about. So many people are not familiar with independent Catholicism or the independent sacramental movement. How did you find out about it? Um, well, actually online, that on AOL, that I was a member of at the time, there was a lady by the name of Reverend Ann, and she identified herself as a priest in the Free Catholic Church. And I just loved the name Free Catholic Church, the idea that we could be free, but we could also be religious. And, uh, you know, my previous experiences with Christianity were uh, evangelizing and very, uh, I thought, very critical and very harsh. And so this, this notion that we could be free and we could be part of a church, you know, just really appealed. And so I had a series of interactions with her. And it turned out that she was in an independent Catholic church that had apostolic succession uh, that came out of uh, the Catholic Apostolic Church of Antioch. And then uh, I ran across a book, the uh, Melton's uh, Encyclopedia of American Religions. And, uh, and just, I ran into the Church of Antioch and I just, something hit in my heart and it just felt this connection. And then I discovered where I was going to study for the priesthood and the free Catholic Church which was in New York City or uh, New York State, mm -hmm. I discovered that the matriarch of that church who had, had taken over from Herman Adrian Spruit was mm -hmm. actually living in Oregon only about maybe four or five hours away. And so then I got in contact with Marie and uh, began to make trips to uh, Creswell, Oregon, where she was living at the time to explore independent Catholicism. Wow, when would that roughly have been, Archbishop Kemp? That would have been about 1995. Wow, so you've been a part of this movement for 25 years. Uh, it, getting pretty close. And so tell us about the Ascension Alliance. Uh, tell me about your involvement in that. Tell us, all about, tell us all about that. All right, the Ascension Alliance actually started as a mission community of the uh, Catholic Apostolic Church of Antioch. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so I served in that mission. I had a parish community uh, at, uh, that met at my home in uh, Parkland, Washington. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, I was doing ministry work at Olala Recovery Center, uh, you know, working with uh, people that are drug addicts, recovering drug addicts and alcoholics and had actually started there as well. And uh, was ordained a priest in 1997. Uh, at Loretto Chapel in Santa Fe, New Mexico, by Archbishop Richard Gundry and Marie uh, Spruitt, mm -hmm. and uh, was looking for a ministry and found uh, the uh, found Olala Recovery Center and, and started that you know ministry there, and served as a priest and then later as a bishop in the Church of Antioch as you know you know shorthand for that, uh, and uh, uh, actually served in the capacity of when Archbishop Richard Gundry retired uh, in 2009, uh, I was asked by Archbishop Richard to serve as interim presiding bishop of that group, uh, which I did in fact, uh, I coordinated the election for a new uh, permanent presiding bishop in uh, 2009. Okay. You mentioned some names. Do you mind my asking your memories of those persons? So when you mention a person like Marie Spruitt, that's an important yes. name in the history of independent Catholicism. Can you tell us anything about your relationship with her or who she was, any memories that you have of oh, her? Absolutely. It's remarkable absolutely. that we're meeting someone who's known her. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Marie was a really sweet uh, person. Uh, to my knowledge, she was the first, uh, the first woman to be made a co- patriarch of an independent Catholic group in the United States. Now, I can't tell you the year, but I think it probably was early to mid 1980s. And Herman had an idea that ministry should be both men and women. So he, I believe, began ordaining women to the priesthood, uh, maybe as early as the 1960s. And he decided that Marie, his, his wife, should become a co-equal 
leader of the Catholic Apostolic Church of Antioch. And so wow. she was installed as the matriarch with co-equal responsibilities with the patriarch, which was Herman. Wow. Uh, Herman died in about 1990. Uh, mm -hmm. Marie took over the church, continued the operation of Sophia Divinity School, the seminary, uh, moved to Creswell, Oregon, which is where I met her. Wow. And you mentioned Archbishop Richard Gundry as well. Tell us, tell us about him. Uh, Richard Gundry, when uh, Marie took over the church, uh, Richard was a really good administrator and a great pastoral presence. And she had the good sense to appoint mm -hmm. Richard as um, as the day-to-day -day leader of the, the Catholic Apostolic Church of Antioch, and she retained her position as matriarch of the church. Uh, he became director of clergy. He supervised the school, which was moved to Santa Fe, New Mexico, uh, and uh, was the leader of the Church of Antioch at Santa Fe, uh, which held its services every Sunday morning at the world-famous Loreto Chapel in downtown Santa Fe. Of course. How cool. So I didn't know that there was a connection between that chapel and the independent Catholic movement. Well, the uh, the nuns at the Loreto Chapel, mm -hmm. uh, where they had the famous miraculous staircase, right. uh, sold it and a hotel purchased it. And the hotel and the purchase included uh, not only the grounds where the chapel had been, but also the, the chapel itself. And so they began to market the Loreto Chapel as a tourist attraction uh, in Santa Fe, which is very active and very successful. And uh, Richard, who was a great relationship builder, uh, formed a relationship with the manager, the general manager of the hotel and, uh, and arranged for a contract between the community in Santa Fe and Loreto Chapel, such that this independent Catholic group could use that chapel every Sunday morning for mass. Wow, very cool. I was not aware of that history. So tell us about your, your current ministry, Archbishop Kemp. What do you do for the people of God? Uh, well, first of all, I continue my ministry at Olala Recovery Center okay. with people that are uh, in uh, drug and alcohol uh, recovery treatment. Uh, and uh, what I tell the folks at Olala when they ask me about, do I have a church outside? Well, the answer is I have administrative tasks that I do for the church. Okay. And so in addition to a personal ministry, which is uh, Ascension Mission Ministries, uh, that I also handle the day-to-day -day administrative affairs of the Ascension Alliance. Okay. You say you continue your ministry at, at Olala. How long have you been there now? It sounds like it's been some a number of years. Since Easter Sunday, 1998. 1998, 22 years are going on now. There you go. Wow. Talk about a model of fidelity of faithfulness to the people of God. I um, tell people that it's the longest volunteer job I've ever had. I love it. And you I know, know you would, go ahead. Sorry, when I first began there, uh -huh. uh, just to sort of um, lend um, some spiritual authenticity to the experience, uh, that I was a fairly young new priest, and I suspect that when I first started celebrating Mass there, that I may not have been the most uh, liturgically proficient priest. Uh -oh. But one of the one of the things uh, which is still true today, from time to time, uh, but one of the things that uh, uh, Archbishop Richard, my mentor, always told me was: number one, show up even if you don't feel like it. Number two, get your ego out of the way. And number three, let God do the work and you get to watch. Okay. So uh, Pentecost Sunday, 1998, uh, I've never in my whole life considered myself to be a Baptist, but I had a person who wanted to be baptized. Okay. And for people in recovery, baptism, I've discovered, is incredibly important because most people who are addicts and alcoholics have had a very colorful life uh, with a lot of mistakes. And there's a lot of regret, a lot of remorse, and a lot of desire to start life fresh and to do it differently. And so when the person asked me to do a baptism, I said yes immediately. Of course, I've never done a baptism before. And uh, as I was getting ready to start doing the baptism in the main classroom at the recovery center, 
I had another person say, well, would you baptize me as well? And I said, well, of course. And so now I have two people. And then a third person oh. showed up. Uh -huh. So I've got three people wanting to be baptized on Pentecost Sunday morning. Uh -huh. Well, then two more people showed up. And so I had five that day wanting to be baptized. Wow. That year at Alala Recovery Center, I had exactly 50 people who were baptized at Olala, not wow. 49, not 51, exactly 50. It's yeah. never happened before, obviously. It wow. never happened since. Wow. And so, you know, that sort of sent me a message that, uh, that God has his way, and he also has his way of communicating with us, even though we don't necessarily recognize that he's talking to us. Right. Wow, John the Baptist, the smiling down on heaven, and to think that all that happened on Pentecost as well, the day on which we celebrate the outpouring of the Spirit. What a great story. Yeah. Archbishop Kemp, tell us, what other ministries have you engaged in over the years? Because I know that I know of you more from the world of theology, that you all have a school of theology as well. Anything you might tell us about that and yeah. or other ministries um, that you've been involved in as well? I also serve as rector of Ascension Theological College, uh -huh. which is the college, The I think of it as the educational wing or the educational branch of the Ascension Alliance, okay. which is a, um, an independent Catholic seminary uh, that is open to all members of the Ascension Alliance or anybody who approaches the Alliance, and also other independent Catholic jurisdictions within the movement. And so um, in the state of Washington, it is required that you have you have to be either accredited by a regional or a national accrediting association. You have to have state approval or you have to have religious exempt status. And so it's okay. too cumbersome to try to achieve accreditation for an online uh, distance learning program. Uh, however, getting religious exempt status seemed to work. Uh, and so we applied for religious exempt status with the uh, with the accrediting body, with the uh, the degree authorization branch of, uh, it's got a new name now, but at the at, now it's called the Washington Student Achievement Council, which is our state regulatory body. Um, so we applied, we submitted our curriculum, uh, so that they could review that. I had a personal meeting with the authorities at our state accrediting body, uh, and we were granted religious exempt status uh, shortly after the alliance was founded in 2009. And so we offer a Bachelor of Divinity, a Master of Divinity, Master of Pastoral Counseling, a Master of Theological Studies for people who are interested in more creative kinds of ministry, and a Master of Spirituality for people who are more interested in self-improvement, in addition to a Doctor of Ministry degree for those who already have an MDiv and who are interested in continuing their education. Awesome. Tell us, what would we have to Google or where would we find that on the internet? For those who are interested in that and or in the Ascension Alliance, where do we find y'all? Um, go to Ascension Alliance, all lowercase, all one word, dot org. Okay. You'll find a website. It's uh, very outdated. We need to do some work updating and getting into the 21st century. But you will find uh, some links that provide uh, some general information about the Alliance as well as a directory of clergy and also uh, a link for our formation program, which is Ascension Theological College. As part of this series, Archbishop Kemp, we're asking those we interview about their greatest joys in ministry, but also their greatest challenges. Do you mind if we start with the challenges first? I'm thinking, especially if you're talking about a, a formation program, that that has been something that we as independent and old Catholics have been especially challenged in that area. Any challenges that you might wish to share with respect to that formation program and or any other experiences in ministry? Um, the first challenge is dealing with the bureaucratic uh, uh, system where you have to get either approval, uh, accreditation, or religious exam status. And so dealing with the bureaucracy, developing the curriculum, mm -hmm. uh, finding people to teach the courses, and of course, uh, recruiting the students. That's a lot of challenges in a short sentence there. What about the jail? It seems to be what about the, go, go for it. And I do believe that things kind of, uh, even though things are challenges, I do believe that when you put one foot in front of the other, that things seem to fall into place. 
And so I'm very pleased that we have uh, developed a really solid, we, we believe, a really solid uh, program uh, that really is quite good in its quality. In fact, we just had the first graduate of the program from somebody who was not going to be a priest in the church, in the Ascension Alliance of uh, somebody from, uh, well, his name is Sean. I don't want to, you know, I don't know about confidentiality rules and so forth, but, uh, but he is from the Progressive Catholic Church and will be ordained in early June uh, 2020. Uh, really loved the program, feels really good about it. And we got some nice, uh, nice feedback from, uh, from Bishop uh, Joe Siccione, who is the, uh, the uh, uh, leader of that jurisdiction. How cool that y'all are working and informing ministers for other communities. That's just really, really great. And he says is that uh, Sean has really grown and changed and really stepped into his role uh, as a future priest. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Congratulations, Joe. What about some of the greatest joys in ministry? If you were to sum up some of the greatest joys or to tell a story or two of the joys that you've experienced as, uh, as one well, who serves I, the people of God? Yeah, it's almost too, too, uh, too many to, uh, to recount. Um, in terms of coming up with one specific great joy, I, I, you know, every Sunday morning when we celebrate the Holy Eucharist, uh, and when you, when you go in there and you do your job and you just let the spirit flow through you, and then you see people in the, in the audience crying because they've had a positive experience with the church some of them for the first time. Uh, some of them are, are Catholics from before that have come to Mass and have found acceptance. Others are people who don't come from the Catholic tradition, but they have come to have a really deep experience uh, with, the, with the Eucharist. Uh, and, uh, and so when, uh, I never take credit for that, but when you see people genuinely emote and have a genuine um, emotional, spiritual experience, um, I'm not sure you get much better than that. Yeah. Very cool. I have to ask Archbishop Kemp, you were with us here in Austin in May for a celebration of confirmations. We really ha loved having you here to be able to share the gift of the Spirit with those who are with us. Anything that you might share about that experience of being able to share the gift of the Holy Spirit with folks here at Holy Family? Well, I was, uh, I was uh, blessed is the best way that I can put it. I felt so connected with the folks there. Uh, it was such a, a wonderful, positive experience uh, that, uh, you know, and again, you know, I mean, some of the, some of, most of the confirmants were young, uh, but some were more mature, were adults. And some of those who were adults and came up and who received the Holy Spirit, uh, which I think of as uh, being skin for Jesus, uh, actually had tears rolling down their heads. And, uh, and I felt that I made an individual connection with each person that, uh, that came. And I have to say is that um, I was at least as blessed as each and every one of those. And I just, uh, I just felt such love uh, for them and from them that uh, it was one of, those, uh, one of those moments that you treasure. I love it. So thank you for that opportunity. My pleasure. But I also love how you talk about being skin for Jesus. I just think that's a great image of how it is that I often talk about how it is that we have to be the hands and the heart of Christ in this world, but be the skin of Jesus. That just, it becomes real all of a sudden when you're talking about being Jesus' skin in this world. And it's true. You know, in the, in the Catholic tradition, they say that Jesus is experienced in the community. Jesus is experienced in the Eucharist. Jesus is experienced in the church, you know, three different places. And, uh, and when you think about confirmation and somebody who's turning over their life to Christ, to the spirit of love, and uh, is willing to, to go out into the world to be a member of the community and to love rather than to be angry or to judge or to hate, uh, that's pretty special. Amen. Thank you, Archbishop, Archbishop Alan Kemp. What else would you like to share with us? Any, any final words or thoughts or reflections on independent Catholicism and or your ministry? Well, independent Catholicism is a challenge. Uh -huh. uh, there are bureaucratic issues. There are uh, people issues that you have to deal with. Uh -huh. 
But on whole, it seems that we're in a time of reformation. I believe that we're at a time when the independent Catholic movement is getting ready to take off, that something is happening and it has nothing to do with anything that I'm doing or you're doing necessarily or anybody else. It is the spirit that is at work that people are looking for an alternative where every single person is welcome, where the sacraments are not used as a way to reward or to punish people for what they think or how they have behaved or the mistakes that they've made, is that we're living, we're living the ministry of Jesus. We are becoming skin for Jesus because we are accepting our brothers and our sisters and providing this opportunity for worship and for personal you know, transformation, which can, t which I believe can only happen, you know, really, uh, you know, as a result of God's work. Now, I also have a background as a, as a therapist and also as an educator. And as a therapist, I didn't feel that just talking to people uh, and even being able to give them insight really was cutting it in terms of doing everything that needed to happen in a person's life. And I felt that religion, spirituality is really um, what makes it possible for a genuine transformation to occur. I'm not saying that therapy is not helpful. I'm not saying that all of those things, but I'm saying that it goes beyond. Now, I have to tell you, you know, in relationship to the confirmation, is it a confirmation? I shared a story about my wife who died about a year and a half ago, is, is that I met her taking one of my classes in human services. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, she appeared at the class and we did a, an exercise that I actually learned in my DMEN program where you place an object on an altar in the round and then you tell a story about that object. And what I was asking students to do was to share an object about why they were interested in taking a course on human services. Well, my wife, Claudia, who I did not know at the time, she was, you know, a new student to me, you know, came up to the altar in the round. I don't even remember what she put on the altar, but I remember that she told me that she wanted to be skin for Jesus. Wow. I've never forgotten that. Wow. I think that I probably fell in love with her at that moment. I was not terribly religiously oriented at that particular point in time. It wasn't until later that I began to pursue uh you know, ministry in the priesthood. And, uh, and, uh, and I just have to say is, is that I think that that's where it's at, is that if all of us can learn how to be skin for Jesus, then we have a chance to be irritated with somebody or to sort of overlook whatever is going on and to, and to try to respond to God's impulse and to be love, to express love, to be accepting of that other person. I think that that's where it's at. And I think that that's what people in the independent Catholic movement are trying to do. Amen. Let's all go out and be skin for Jesus. Archbishop Allen, could we invite you as we conclude today to, to invite you to lead us in, in, a, in a prayer? Absolutely. Um, in the name of God, who is the creator, the word made flesh, and the Holy Spirit, O oh Lord, we give you thanks for this opportunity to be here today, to talk with others, to... Uh, to try our best to be skin for Jesus. Um, we know that, uh, that by you being a part of our life, that you animate our very being. We are so grateful for this opportunity and we thank for your continued guidance and wisdom as we strive to open our hearts, to open our eyes, to open our ears, mm -hmm. and to be with our fellow human being each and every moment as we continue our journey on this on this world, this life. Amen. Thank you, Archbishop Alan Kemp of the Ascension Alliance. We appreciate your being with us for telling us about your ministry to the Ascension Alliance and to the people of God, but also for reminding us that all of us, if we wanted to, could be skin for Jesus. Indeed, all of us could be extraordinary Catholics. Thank you, Archbishop. Thank you for inviting me. My pleasure.